back to the Diagram Media Forum, The Journey to Better Care, Diagnostics Beyond COVID-19. Last year, Roche Diagnostics compiled research data from the public health care providers and policymakers in 11 countries for their perspectives of the impact of diagnostics in healthcare today. We will now take a look at the results, their implications, and why it is important to integrate diagnostics in healthcare to achieve better outcomes. With me now are Mr. Lance Little, Roche Diagnostics Managing Director for Asia Pacific, and Mr. Ringaswamy Sankaran Narayanan, or Dr. Sankar, Director of Preventive Oncology at India's Kakinos Healthcare. He's also a senior visiting scientist at the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer. As you are with Roche Diagnostics, Mr. Little, could you take us through the findings of the survey? Thanks very much, Salma. Um, and, and before I do, I guess what I'd like to do is, is uh, on behalf of Roche, uh, um, thank uh, Dr. Sankar and also our previous three panelists. I think it was a fascinating conversation we've just had. So I want to just take that opportunity to, to thank everybody. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure whether you've got slides there, but as, as, you, as you set up, um, this was a, a survey done across 11 countries and surveying in excess of 9,000 um, uh, healthcare professionals and informed public. And informed public is people who have interacted with the healthcare systems in recent times. Um, so I think this was, an, this was an interesting and certainly fascinating um, uh, approach to this question around diagnostics, which tends to get buried under the bigger banner of healthcare in general. And I've been in the industry in excess of 35 years, and um, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it's the first time in my career that, that, that people around me actually get some understanding of, of what we do in laboratories and providing tests uh, for clinicians to make great decisions on. And, um, you know, so this to me is a, is, a, is a perfect moment in time, which unfortunately has probably been triggered by a global pandemic. Um, but regardless of that, I think the spotlight has gone on to diagnostics. And as the previous panel described, I think that's a, um, uh, uh, a tremendous opportunity to highlight a tool within the healthcare industry in general that can um, either drive towards uh, increasing access to fundamental healthcare information. In many of our low middle income countries, this is the priority. Um, and drive towards meaningful and targeted use in perhaps more developed um, countries as well of very expensive medicines, for example. Personalized healthcare is about driving up to the, to the specifics of a singular cancer, for example, in the oncology space. So I think this, is, this awareness around diagnostics has, has uh, really been highlighted over recent times. So if you go to the next slide, Yeah, and, and you know, there was some interesting insights, and I won't go into huge amounts of detail, but to give you a flavor, 63% of, of those uh, who value overall health now place an importance on the role of in vitro diagnostics um, in maintaining health. So this is an awareness and understanding that if I do some tests, that will give me some information that allows me to make good health decisions. And I think this is extremely healthy. And as we heard in the previous panel, this also is part and parcel of education. And, um, you know, I'm sure this varies across the world, um, but it's heartening to know that people understand that by testing smartly, particularly in areas where diseases can be uh, dealt with if they're dealt with early and, and cervical cancer is a great example of that. So if we move to the next slide, um, you can see that within the healthcare professional group and the informed public, um, you know, the, the value of early detection, um, it varies a little bit and you would expect that healthcare professionals would rate that much higher, but I'm, I'm extremely comfortable with the fact that three quarters of the informed public also understand this as well. Um, and also understanding the role of monitoring and helping to manage diseases that go on and on, more chronic diseases and the, the role of diagnostic tests there. For example, diabetes care is, is perhaps, perhaps one that we, we know where patients manage and monitor themselves. 
uh, people on warfarin treatment, for example, um, also manage their coagulation status themselves and, and are used to doing regular testing. So next slide. Um, however, and it was touched by our earlier panel members, so I was, to hear, I was pleased to hear this, that, um, you know, there are some tests that are avoided for fear of the results, um, and particularly um, HIV, for example, uh, hepatitis, and, and um, HPV for cervical screening is uh, the three big ones that came through quite, consistency, quite consistently along the, the survey. So this is sort of indicating this human element that we all have, which is, um, look, don't tell me the bad news. And if there's a risk for some bad news, then we have to get over that and educate people of the advantage of early understanding, early information that can then lead to a good outcome as opposed to ignoring and then uh, having to live with a poor outcome later on. So this was somewhat of a concern. Um, and then, yeah, essentially uh, areas that, that were barriers to information we found quite interesting. Um, and to pick out a couple of here, a lack of information and understanding is still there. And I guess we would expect that, um, but an area in which we need to focus on. And another one that I found particularly interesting, and this was highlighted in uh, Japan, for example, is patients' busy lifestyle. Now, hearing our earlier panel conversation, I, I sort of per perhaps postulate that this could be linked back to the education piece, which I think was posed as one of the questions. Imagine if we go through our educational life, our early schooling life, understanding the value of prioritizing our health uh, then maybe prioritizing it in a busy lifestyle, which we all have, um, may help this element of some of the barriers that come uh, that, that we've identified um, to good diagnostic testing. So next slide. And I think that's us. Great. So as a backdrop, fascinating information. Um, and uh, I think really the survey has, has highlighted a number of areas that I think allow us to go deeper into uh, lifting the role of diagnostics within the healthcare environment. Salma, I think you're on mute. Ah, my apologies. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Little. I'm going to turn to Dr. Sanka now because we just saw your presentation and it showed that 31% of healthcare providers use diagnostics because of national guidelines. I believe India published a national essential diagnostic list in 2019 following the WHO's evidence-based guidelines released a year before that. Has publication of that list in India resulted in any change in practice, Dr. Sankar? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Selma. Very pertinent question. Generally, people think publishing a guideline and leaving it in some place is going to change the way healthcare practitioners or even the general public is going to change. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, particular national document has been prepared, but in my view, it has not been disseminated widely. There are many practitioners who are not aware of it. And uh, if you take India, India is a country of countries. You know, it's so vast with uh, so many different cultures, uh, with uh, extremely varying healthcare infrastructure and attitudes and the attitudes of the population as well as healthcare practitioners. I wouldn't say this has made a tremendous impact as of now, okay? And that I would partly put the uh, responsibility on the inability of the system to disseminate uh, the, the guidelines to a large proportion of the clients, okay? And then there is another bottleneck. You know, you distribute something to a client, doesn't mean the client has to read it. One of the problems with the guidelines is the guidelines are extensive and people have very little time to read. This is where an executive summary or a brief outline of what the guideline means and what the guideline recommends is of considerable value. In, in healthcare, I believe in dogma because you can give so many options as you reach on the top of the ladder.
but at the very basic situation at the most essential uh, health service level dogma is very very important and so i would say in short uh, the guideline is a is a good development and the government has to be appreciated uh, for that and basically it relied on uh, a who document which are uh, which is very carefully thought about and brings out you know what is really relevant for countries of uh, different socio economic order in the world because developing a who document is not an not an easy task because the world is highly heterogeneous as the french say so um, uh, so based on that this has been developed but there has to be more attempts on disseminating it publicizing it professional societies taking it up and uh, widely disseminating it this this all has to happen but having said that there are certain niche areas which have received attention for example my previous colleagues were repeatedly pointing towards hpv testing uh this is this has received a lot of attention now in recent years as compared to you know four years back uh thanks to uh increasingly the professional societies taking note of it trying to educate the population trying to educate their own membership for example the indian federation of obstetrics and gynecology societies of india is the largest professional body in the world with more than 42000 members uh you know coming from nooks and corners of india and uh, educating them through the state chapters and motivating at least some of them to take up this cause by disseminating it to general practitioners because general practitioners is a very important component of healthcare which is seldom seldom understood everybody thinks the way the healthcare is developing here has to go to the specialist first which is a completely a nonsensical approach to healthcare but that is partly because of the of the the lack of uh, belief at the lowest level of the health system so they have taken up a huge effort in uh, in in educating people so this type of education is needed for uh, for the most common ailments which have a major public health impact which has happened of course with the covid <laughs> you know it has it has made tremendous change in the way the covid diagnostics is used uh, the way that uh, uh, sometimes people go overboard uh, imaging technologies have been used to assess the severity of the covid 19 illness and uh, and in recent uh, months uh the diagnostics for um, uh dengue has received considerable attention so so there is a positive fallout but this has to be further reinforced thank you dr sankar so what you are saying is a list is good but you must have an executive summary because doctors don't have time to read everything so you should have it briefly and two you have to be able to disseminate it uh to all the doctors Uh, out there but in this exp- uh, experience shows that there are certain uh, doctors in certain diseases with uh, societies that are more likely to spread the word than in others and why is that so i mean are there some more social doctors and less social doctors i mean this is some of i'm 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 trained as an oncologist in radiation oncology and clinical oncology uh, i would say that more than the oncology societies the gynecology society has taken up the cause for uh, both for hpv vaccination as well as uh, hpv testing in a more uh, uh, active fashion and i am really also surprised uh, the pediatricians are not that vocal about it generally you would consider pediatricians as a as a as a very main uh, one of the main uh, armamentarium for promoting uh, vaccination immunization so the immunization um, sort of concept still lies with chronic disease, uh, uh, lies with infectious disease rather than chronic disease uh, you know my colleague from taiwan was repeatedly pointing out how taiwan has made a lot of progress because 
that was one of the earliest countries to introduce hepatitis B vaccination. And already the Taiwan liver cancer registry is showing more than 70% reduction in one of the most fatal cancers in the cohorts less than 30 years of age who have received the vaccination. Okay. Probably such messages are not that highlighted, are not made fully aware to people, particularly healthcare practitioners, as well as to the general public, as the way an immunization is a, a first line defense against, say, something like poliomyelitis, and how uh, smallpox has been eradicated by the World Health Organization. So, so th this could be. Uh, one, one, one of the reasons, you know, the different perceptions. And then if you take oncologists, you know, radiation oncologists, they are completely taken away by the technology which is changing every year. You have the more sophisticated machines, more sophisticated technology, and technology makes people proud that owning a technology, whether they use it, it's a different question. Even if you go to Africa, People would like to have the most sophisticated linear accelerator without thinking whether that linear accelerator will serve the purpose given the electricity situation, the affordability of the population, the ability to maintain a service contract and to maintain the equipment. So the pride. And then you go to medical oncologists, they have been completely diverted of the attention by targeted therapies, uh, liquid biopsies and all types of things which are which have a role, but not on the other hand, at the most fundamental level in improving outcome from cancer control. So, and the surgeons, of course, the surgeons are very busy talking, talking about the techniques, but at least in surgery, in cancer surgery, they have been moving backwards towards less uh, radical surgeries. A typical example is uh, breast cancer. The way they have moved from um, uh, Ralsted uh, radical mastectomy to a lumpectomy now is phenomenal. So there are different aspects which have led to this type of dichotomy or multicotomy. I don't know if there is such a word exists in English, but uh, since you speak English, uh, I speak English, you speak English, I think we can use this English here. So so I, 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 I think this is, uh, this is a major factor. You know, Dr. Sankar, you've raised several very interesting points that has got, I think, Prof. Jamil very interested, and she's put up her hands to ask a question or make a comment. So, Prof. Jamil, please feel free. Yes. So, regarding this essential diagnostic tests list, so the way these lists are prepared, uh, you have the policymakers and the epidemiologists working with pathologists or microbiologists. Where are the end users? Where are the clinicians who are going to offer these tests? Uh, where are the people who are going to use these tests? So this lack of engagement of a very crucial group of individuals actually tells you why these kinds of lists often fail. So there should be engagement because uh, there was a mention of engaging societies. So yes, societies should be engaged upfront and their opinion should be taken into account. Uh, when the lists are being prepared, because you see some of the tests may be totally irrelevant from the point of view of the clinician who will be actually using them. And there may be some important tests missing, which may not get included in the list because the people who are responsible for preparing the list are not the ones who are actually managing patients. So I just wanted to make this comment. Yeah. Uh, may I respond to this, uh, Salman? Please yeah. do. Uh, in fact, you are partially right. My limited experience has been with WHO on cancer. And then I have been an observant of what is happening with uh, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, pulmonary disease, and all those things. In all those developments, they have concentrated, including the equipment, uh, the philosophies, the management guidelines, the diagnostic guidelines, there has been a substantial involvement of our clinical colleagues. Uh, in fact, if you see the, see the guidelines, you will, you, will, you will see the difference. Take the simple guideline, which has come for uh, the management of cervical neoplasia. It has 
an extensive involvement by the clinicians in the in the development of uh, uh, these type of guidelines. So things are changing. And in fact, as I already told you, WHO has to deal with a wider world. It is not, they are not dealing with Singapore or they are not dealing with Peru. They are dealing with, uh, also dealing with Burkina Faso and Niger. So one has to take into account, you know, the different realities one has to face in public health services and then tailor make the recommendations. And in fact, I, I have a great respect the way the amount of uh, effort which goes into developing these documents. And again, dissemination is the weakest point. Right. Actually, Dr. Sankar, you mentioned earlier uh, that there are certain uh, specialists that push for diagnostics. How about your family physicians, the general practitioners? Because shouldn't a lot of this be at their level? And has the message gone out to them in India? You know, um, the most common uh, in vitro diagnostics that people do is a, is a routine uh, complete blood count, uh, routine uh, LFT, uh, renal function tests, um, lipid profile, um, and uh, these sort of things which come as a package. And in fact, the laboratories have done a, a, a terrible job, a, a good job, I, I didn't mean in a negative way, a good job in offering these packages at affordable rates. So this is something I can readily think of. Now, most general practitioners will use it to assess anemia, to look into the liver health, to look into um, uh, you know, diabetes, um, you know, control of diabetes uh, and uh, even for screening for diabetes using glycosylated hemoglobin or random blood sugar and uh, th those types of things. This is something which is, which, which I can readily think of that most practitioners, nook and corner of India are using. This is because of the wide availability of the auto um, um, analyzers, you know, where they can churn out results uh, in in a matter of uh, minutes or hours, depending upon the load they have. So this has made uh, a considerable impact in the way the general uh, health is being assessed by by people. But if you take into very specific things like, and let me talk from the cancer point of view, you know, people using uh, <clears throat> a fit test, a fecal local blood test, the immunochemical test for early detection of uh, colorectal cancer or uh, uh, HPV testing, ordering for a HPV testing. People realize these are some of the very specialized areas and that will require, fortunately, this is also important rather than flooding people, you know, 15 year olds with fecal local blood tests and uh, uh, rapid diagnostics for HPV. In a way, it is a, it is a blessing in disguise. But on the other hand, that to be better used in those particular uh, target age groups for early detection of disease. So it is a mixed picture, uh, I, I, I would say. And then again, like I this. also wanted to, uh, point out one more thing. You know, because of this very basic test they do, they see the patients and at least some of them do physical examination, which is a disappearing art in modern medical practice. So this, I think, is a, is a big plus point of this type of interactions. Thank you very much. So it sounds like that there are some tests that may be overused, some that are underused, but there are some that are widely used. So that's some good news. Could I turn to Mr. Little then? You know, during the COVID pandemic, have you noticed any increase in the use of digital tools besides managing that pandemic itself? And do you have any suggestions on how we can foster the adoption of these tools beyond COVID-19? It's an interesting question that I think many healthcare systems are are, are addressing. I, I think through the through the need of uh, 
you know, the the the, the pressure of COVID, then many barriers were perhaps broken down in, in the need to have to move quickly. And, that, and that's allowed us in the healthcare industry to perhaps experiment in a way. You know, if I think at a very, very simplistic level, the fact that I have to show my vaccination status or my negative test result before I walk into a building in many countries um, is actually a model of of giving the the the, the uh, individual or the patient um, the control of their healthcare information. Now that's a huge move, right? Um, healthcare systems don't work that way today. The information is locked up in an institution, and you know I'm a big believer that if we are going to really reshape healthcare systems, then the information that is relevant to our clinical colleagues here on this call and, and all the clinical colleagues that are working day and night to make critical decisions, having that information at their fingertips at the right time is critical. And do digital tools play a role in that? I believe probably yes, but there's a danger here. I think digitization needs to be really looked at um, in, in its appropriateness. So, for example, we've seen, you know, um, and, and uh, Dr. Jamal described the use of tele teleconsultations and how that was useful in COVID. But is that also useful in a uh, multi-morbidity situation where the patient has many disease states going on? Perhaps not so much. So I think we need to be careful about saying one thing or the other, but the term of a hybrid model is absolutely clear to me. And if you think about areas that could this, this could be could be sensible in, and I'll bring up what Dr. Sankar was saying earlier on about, about guidelines. You know, the latest data shows um, healthcare information doubles every 72 days. I, I, I feel for every clinician that's out there in the world, if you're trying to stay up to date, you can't. So this is where I think digital tools, perhaps, perhaps um, in the hands of a clinician, a registrar at four o'clock in the morning in an emergency department with an algorithm on his phone to work out how to treat um, a potential uh, congestive heart failure patient that's come in could be very useful. Um, so you know, in certain areas, I, I think the opportunities are there and we will learn what works and what doesn't work. But in a general sense, digital tools need to integrate with the healthcare system. Okay, I think, I think it's a bit like boiling the ocean if we think we're going to create an entire new healthcare system around digital tools. No, I don't see that happening. Maybe sometime in the future, but we've got to learn first. So they've got to add value. They've got to integrate with the healthcare system. And the healthcare system needs to support their viability. So in other words, fund them properly. If it's, if it's a centralized funded healthcare system, um, government funded public health system, then, then the, the, the financial flow through the system to incorporate digital tools needs to be there. If it's a user pay system, for example, the digital use of digital tools cannot overburden the, the, the cost challenges that exist in perhaps low middle income countries where if you don't have cash in your wallet today, you, even if you're sick, you're not interacting with the healthcare system. So digital tools, I think, are going to be a key driver in helping us improve healthcare systems. But it's not a blanket statement. I think hybrid models are absolutely going to be the, the, the requirement. And testing and trialing where it makes sense and accepting that in some, some cases they don't make sense and they don't add value. Right. So it's too, uh, we aren't able to get rid of doctors right now in favor of artificial intelligence then. But you know something you said earlier about uh, cost and, and diagnostics and things like that? brings to mind that different countries have different capabilities and uh, capacities. So while I might want to have all these diagnostic tests, it may not be possible for every country to do so. So what should different countries, their own healthcare systems be mindful of when they want to push for diagnostics or greater use of diagnostics to ensure that it becomes a success and not just a white elephant? Mm. Well, well, I think it's about appropriate use of diagnostics and how we can use this lever better. So um, there, there's, there's an old statistic that talks about 2% of healthcare spend is spent on diagnostic tools, yet 
um, in excess of 60% of the clinical decisions are made. Now, that's a huge lever, right? Um, you know, if 2% became three, wow, what would that look like? How much information, relevant information, would be in the hands of clinicians to make better decisions? But as I said at the very beginning, we have to think of this, I think of this in two dimensions. One is... Um, as Dr. Sankar described, you know, do, a, diagnostics is not new. This is not a new thing we've just found. Um, this has fa been foundational to healthcare from the very beginning. And routine diagnostics, liver functions, renal functions, full blood counts, et cetera, need to be a focus in many of our emerging countries because we still need, that's tremendously valuable information to manage basic health within a population, and there's still many parts of the world where that's not accessible, um, and we touched on that. So we need to go broad across the base, but then equally, the science of diagnostics is driving so much. When we think about the technologies of sequencing and, and the power that that brings to oncology treatments down to being able to tailor a treatment to a single individual, we're going up as well. Right. Um, so we need to go broad and we need to go up also. So for me, it's about the appropriate use of diagnostic tests. So if a country needs to build a foundation of health, then it's focusing on on the breadth, the basics. Do, do, does, do, does, does my population's renal function work? And where do I find the problems? Hepatitis. We talked about hepatitis and infectious disease. These are tests and tools that have been around for a long time, and we need to keep driving those broadly across, the, across certain countries. Yet other countries may have solved that problem and are more moving towards spending their healthcare dollar a little more smartly. So rather than a blanket treatment across a whole group of patients with a certain disease bucket, maybe we can individualize that so patient A gets one drug and patient B gets another drug that will work more effectively for them. And that's the personalized healthcare storyline. So I'm really conscious about not using generalizations here and, and, and using diagnostic tools that, are, that many are not new and the science keeps bringing new ones in, um, which is fantastic, but also understanding which, which axis we play and different countries will focus on different axes. And Salma, you yeah, unmute yeah. myself again. Yeah. So what you're saying is that every country has to decide for itself where its healthcare system is, what is most useful to it at this time, and not just go out for every diagnostic test that's coming on board. Yes. Now we've got quite a lot of questions coming in from participants, so I'm going to switch uh, to what they want to know. There is one question for Dr. Sankar, and it is: How accurate are these diagnostic tests? How common are false positives? And if there are a lot of false positives, wouldn't that burden the system as well as put the patient through unnecessary treatments? False positivity, as you rightly said, is a, is a major concern. But generally, when we order a particular investigation and get the results, we consider the possibility of the false positivity probability much lower because these are all accredited tests and done in accredited laboratories um, and, and things like that. But wherever there is a human judgment involved, just like one of the most critical diagnostic investigations in the case of cancer, uh, the eosin uh, based um, uh, eosin hematoxylin uh, histopathology, which is read still by uh, human pathologists. Sorry, could, most you, could, you of, explain, could you explain that a little bit? Because some of us, are, most of us are not doctors, so we don't quite okay, understand that. Okay, okay. This is the very basic pathology where you take a biopsy specimen and then stain them with two stains called eosin and hematoxylin. And then once these stains are done, the slides are read and reported by pathologists. This is the, the most fundamental histopathological confirmatory test for cancer. Then building on that, then you have special tests for lymphomas, leukemias, and uh, many, uh, many other uh, diseases, but this is the most basic. So what I'm meaning to say is, when there is a huge level of human intervention in interpreting the results, the false positivity is higher, okay? 
So, uh, for example, the example that I provided the biopsy, in a low volume center, the possibility of committing uh, an error is very high and that can have very important implications for the patient. But in a high volume center, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, committing such mistakes is rare because there is multiple consultations and all those things and getting second opinions and doing special strains to process that uh, particular biological specimen to come into uh, to correct come into the correct the so called correct final diagnosis uh, occurs so uh, this is one area you know in 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 particularly in cancer where there is a lot of implications correct basic histopathological diagnosis of cancer and then on top of that as i already said there are so many other tests which are which are there. So now what are people trying to do? The people are trying to automate the images and they are trying to use artificial intelligence systems which will go through several images and then try to bring out a, a, a diagnosis. But this is also, as of now, I wouldn't put my 100% belief uh, on that. I would better put my 100% belief on any human interventions in a place which is highly uh, organized and sees large volume of uh, uh, specimens in a year. The biggest right. advantage of uh, the basic test that I was referring to, most of them are auto analysis. It is not a technician taking and using a pipette and staining and manually counting, that doesn't happen. So in such situations, the possibility of false positivity is much, much lower. Anyway, the false positivity and any consequence is the responsibility of the treating doctor and patients should generally uh, feel comfortable that the possibility of the false positivity has been minimized in the way the physicians approach. Right, so experience is a major factor in yes. the accuracy of the test. Now, before uh, I take the last question, could I ask all participants to take part in an online poll? It's a live poll, so results are immediate and we can see what everybody thinks. So now, uh, Lance, after what Dr. Sanka says, is there a danger of uh, overdiagnosing? Can it lead to a culture of testing for everyone and perhaps turn us all into hypochondriacs? <laughs> I, I, I suspect in some parts of the world this has already happened. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, I mean, the internet is a powerful thing, but of course it's all information, good, bad, and indifferent, right? So, you know, I, I, I would have to say awareness, though, is, is a key element. Um, and I think if we are smart about this, and COVID's been a great example, I have to say, you know, um, in many cases, uh, you know, COVID seems like it's been a clinical trial that's been debated on social media um, and, uh, you know, a lot of misinformation. And, you know, that's an example of the world we live in today and, and we can't change that, but we, we must grapple with it. So I think, um, are we going to turn into a lot of hypochondriacs? I think we, we in, the, in the medical profession, the healthcare industry itself, need to do a lot of work in now in educating a broader group of people being the general public. Um, because as, as Dr. Sanka just described, for example, if you talk about the accuracy of tests, the science of healthcare is not black and white. There is interpretation. There are, there are variables in this. So we, we have to be very careful about what we throw over the fence into the world of anybody do anything and uh, without the knowledge. So to your part of the question around is there a chance of overdiagnosis, I think um, we have potential in some parts of the world where diagnostic tools are readily available perhaps. And then we've got other parts of the world where basic diagnosis and basic information from diagnostic tests is not in the hands of the people who can make decisions. So there's an underdiagnosis dynamic here. Um, and certainly the survey showed that there is reticence to getting some diagnostic tests done. So I would say it is on the, on the side of underdiagnosing rather than overdiagnosing at the moment. 
Right. So I would like to thank everybody, both the panelists and the participants, for taking part in this session. I'm Sal McCulloch, Senior Health Correspondent at The Straits Times Singapore. On behalf of one Ifra and Roche, I wish all of you a long and healthy life. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Salma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.